you please stand? morning church family it's good to be with you here this uh, first Sunday of June uh, for those of you who don't know me I'm Matthew Carter I'm the uh, deacon of the month for June and I'll let you in on a little secret uh, we deacons aren't perfect um, we tend to grumble some and one of the things we grumble about is being deacon of the month in a month with five Sundays which <laughs> June is The, the only thing we grumble about slightly less is being over communion during Lent because we just have communion over and over and over again. But it's good to be with you here this morning. Um, for those of you visiting with us, we want to uh, send a, a special greeting to you. And uh, on the back of the pew in front of you, there's a slip of paper uh, that will have a record of your attendance with us if you'd fill that out for us and uh, put it in the offering plate when it comes around. Uh, also, a special greeting to those joining us by our broadcast ministry. Um, it's good to have you with us. Uh, if, you're, if you're new to the area and you would like to come, uh, we can arrange uh, to have transportation for you if you call the church office at 359-4077. We can have arrange, uh, arrangements to send the bus to pick you up and take you back home. Um, so now, if y'all would rise, uh, we'll have a prayer, and then after the prayer, a time of greeting. And uh, church members, make sure you seek out a visitor and, and send them a special greeting. Father, we uh, come this morning to you uh, to worship you. We are imperfect people, and we come to worship the the one true and perfect God. And we pray uh, that our worship will be pleasing to you. Just uh, speak to us, speak to us through uh, Brother Tom. Just be with him as he brings the message. And just go with us now as we go into worship. So Christ we pray, amen.
got a little more room up here if anybody else needs to come up. I want to talk to you guys this morning about something. Have you ever seen these? Look, there are post-it notes. You never forget anything anymore, right? And sometimes I need one put right there so I won't forget it. Because, you know, sometimes I put notes on these and stick them somewhere and then I forget where I stuck them. Now, my computer at work has them all around the edges, but, you know, every now and then they turn loose if somebody walks by too fast or something. And then I've lost my note. But we use them at home to remind us, you know, to take out the trash or feed the dog or turn the dryer on or something like that. But did you know that the company 3M makes these? And they're really cool because they'll, they'll stick everywhere. You can write notes and you can do all kinds of stuff with them. Did you know that? See, they'll stick on you too. Yeah. But the company that makes these is called 3M. They're the same people that make scotch tape. Now, y'all know what I'm talking about when I say scotch tape. I bet y'all have made some stuff with scotch tape, haven't you? So, the guy that was making scotch tape decided one day that the sticky on the back of the tape wasn't good enough. So, he was going to work, and he was going to figure out some better sticky stuff. Well, guess what? It didn't work. He failed. It was a glue. It was a kind of glue, but it didn't work. He was a failure. But you know what he did? He didn't give up. He got to asking people at his company, what else could we do with this? And guess what they came up with? Post-it notes. And they probably make more money on post-it notes now than they do on scotch tape. So his failure turned into something good. But he couldn't see that in the beginning. He just saw that he had failed at something. Now, sometimes we do that too, don't we? We fail at things. And sometimes that's okay. And you know, this week we read a, a passage in Proverbs about that. And it says in Proverbs 16, verse 9, In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Now that means if you have a problem and you fail at something, don't worry about it. Try again and just keep on trying because the Lord has a plan. Did you know that? Thank you. The Lord has a plan for you and you and you and you, all of you. The Lord has a plan. So just because you fail one time, don't give up, okay? Think about the post-it notes, okay? All right, let's say our prayers. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we just praise you through our failures. We praise you through our successes, Lord, because we know your hand is on us, Lord, and you will, you will take care of us no matter what, Lord. Now just watch over us through the rest of this day and keep us safe. We ask these things in your name. Amen. <laughs>
all please stand for the reading of scripture. It is taken from Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and verses 20 through 22, page 533 in your pew Bible. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commands with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight, and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver, and search for it as for hidden treasures. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores, he stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice, and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and iniquity, every good path. For wisdom will come into the earth, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you, understanding will guard you. So you will walk in the way of the good, and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will inhabit the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. This is the word of the Lord. We give thanks to God. Remain standing. Let us pray. Lord, we come to a time of offering, and we know that you, you own everything, uh, and we just give back a, a small portion of, of what you've blessed us with. And Lord, just help us to do it 
um, as obedience to you and just bless what we give and uh, help it to be used uh, to reach those who are lost. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Boy, was that nice or what? All right. Y'all ready to begin? You can, you can find your way to Proverbs chapter 1, and you'll be right where I want you to be in just a moment. Um, have you noticed that our lives are, are, are filled with gadgets that we can't use? Automatic sprinklers, uh, GPS devices, fancy blenders, the magic bullet. What is this? You know, I instructions that we can't follow. Uh, the label on your medicine bottle. Does that make any sense to you? Directions for assembling toys, furniture. <laughs> kind of hard to manage your way through that. Forms that we cannot decipher, tax returns, 
Anybody mastered that besides Bill Garvin? Yeah, okay. Tax returns, gym membership contracts, wireless phone bills. Does that make sense to you? Every facet of our lives, even the entertainment and recreation that we try to enjoy, is complicated by ever-widening array of choices, 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 choices. And these choices are coming at us at faster and faster pace. You're, you're taking in so much, you don't have time to process even the most basic kind of, kind of information. Consider, there are now more than 800,000 apps in the Apple App Store. You know how many are used? It's a, just a fraction of that. There are 240 plus selections on the Cheesecake Factory menu. And that's not including the lunch or brunch special. I like this one. There are 135 mascaras, 437 lotions, and 1,992 fragrances at Sephora.com. In 1980, the typical credit card contract was about 400 words. You could manage that, right? Today, many credit card contracts have more than 20,000 words. Is that complicated? All kinds of hidden stuff. There's one company, the PC Pit Stop, deliberately buried in one of their contracts uh, and a part of their end user agreement, an offering to give the first person who found this $1,000. All they had to do was email us a certain address and they would be the first to claim $1,000. You know how long it took for that to happen? It took six months for it to happen before somebody finally found that clause in the, in the contract. Complications. Uh, choices. Just so many choices. But one company has worked hard to counter this kind of complexity. It's Trader Joe's. I don't know if you're familiar with Trader Joe's, but it's a supermarket kind of a store. Trader Joe figured out that uh, having so many choices is really a lousy business model because it overwhelms the customers, it, it clutters the stores, and it undermines the shopping experience. So they think this is a bad thing to have too, too many choices. So Trader jo Joe's offers many fewer products than supermarkets. They offer about 4,000 items, where in the typical supermarket, more than 40,000 items are being offered. That's why you get confused when you walk down the aisle. Stuff is just almost jumping off the, the shelf at you, the way they arrange that stuff. So from 40,000 to 4,000 choices, and the shoppers are appreciating that they don't, are, they're not overwhelmed with the number of choices. Does it work? Well, the chain which has about 350 stores in the U.S. sells an estimated $1,750 in merchandise per square foot in their stores, more than double the sales generated per square foot by Whole Foods Market. Does it work? Simplifying? Ending some of that complication? It works. Um, that has application, too. That has application for your church experience. Did you know that? When our bylaws were written, they were written for a program-driven church. And if you ever sit down and read our church bylaws, you'll discover that there's a reference to nearly every possible program that's available, and there's even a clause in there that says, and in case we come up with some more programs, you need to pay attention to that one too. So being program-driven... Our bylaws are a little bit complicated. You know how many committees we have? Well, I don't know either. <laughs> it's, it's hard to keep up with, with all of that. But we've, we've transitioned from program-driven to becoming more purpose-driven. And in fact, we have gotten so simple in what we want you to do around here. Let's do a little pop quiz. What is it we ask you to do when, you, when you're involved in First Baptist Church? There's just three things. What are those things that we want you to do? Come to worship, join a Bible study, and number three, ministry, ministry. 
That's all. That's all you have to know if you want to know what, what will help you to grow as a, Christ, uh, as a Christian person and what we expect of you as a, as a believer in Christ and as a member of our church. Just three things. Come to worship, join a Bible study, get involved in ministry. Simple, isn't it? That, that takes away a lot of the heartache that, that many people experience in their church experience. You know that this simplicity has a way of affecting your spiritual disciplines or your devotions as well. Um, you need to pare down the number of distractions that you have in order to focus on what's really important. That's the only reason you simplify, so that you can clear away the clutter and get to what's really important in your life. That matters in your personal spiritual disciplines and in your, your devotional life. It matters in the choices you make about your life, about how you're going to live your life, because you need to make wise choices in life to keep on track with what's really important. All you have to do is just sit down and close your eyes and listen for a moment, and you will hear thousands of voices clamoring in your head, appealing for your attention and reminding you of stuff that you ought to do. And of all the thousands of voices that you listen to, that you hear, there's one that needs to stand out above the rest. I think you know where I'm going with this. We began reading the book of Proverbs this week as a church. We're, we're together on the same page. We're looking at the book of Proverbs. How many of you are enjoying Proverbs so far? Proverbs kind of comes at you like a machine gun, doesn't it? Especially when you get toward the latter part of the book. The first nine chapters of, of Proverbs, you know, it's kind of narrative. It's sort of, you kind of get a sense of, uh, of, you know, there's a connection between each of the Proverbs. When you get over to the latter parts of the book of Proverbs, they become a little bit more scattered and a little bit more fast-paced kind of a read, and it's hard to keep all of that in, in your mind at, at one time. Uh, but you're reading from guys like Solomon and, and a guy named Hezekiah. He had some workers that collected some Proverbs, and, and I don't, nobody knows anything about a guy named Azure or another guy named Lemuel, but these are guys that have collected Proverbs, and these Proverbs are, are attributed as going back all the way to, to King Solomon, who was the king of Israel following David. And, and so this is very ancient material, although it was collected at later times. It's, it's very, very interesting stuff. And Proverbs is really about practical wisdom for living. It's just how you can get along with life, how you can do in life what God wants you to do. It's, it's cast in the, in the form of instruction that a parent would give to a child. Just imagine a time and a place, a culture, where parents actually sat down and taught their children directly things that mattered in life. That's what Proverbs is all about. It's a conversation between a father and a son, between a mother and a daughter of what makes life work, how to be successful in, in living your life. Proverbs contrast the benefits of seeking wisdom with the pitfalls of living a fool's life. And that's really the choice that you have according to the book of Proverbs. You're either going to be pursuing wisdom on one hand, or you're going to be living a fool's life on the other hand. That's the kind of claim that book of Proverbs makes upon us. So it's important for us to, to kind of get a, a, a grip on the, what the message of, of Proverbs is. Um, Proverbs 1, 7, page 532 in your pew Bible, is uh, where I'd like you to see now. And, and this, is, this is the first choice now. This is the most basic choice that you need to make. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The question comes to my mind, how do you get wisdom? Proverbs says that true wisdom comes from God. You don't get it from any other source. The most appealing alternative that I can think of is to get wisdom within yourself as you reflect upon your own experiences, but Proverbs will convince you that that's a pitfall in and of itself. That if you trust in your own heart, you may think you're doing the right thing, but the end of that kind of a pursuit is the way of death. Pro Proverbs tells us that true wisdom comes from God. So the question, how do you get it? Well, you listen to it. You pray for it. You search for it. You wait for it. One of the things about wisdom is that it comes with time and experience, and especially through your experiences with God. Proverb 2.5, turn there. 
just, just track along here. Proverbs 2.5 is, is in a context that describes this, this dynamic that I've mentioned to you already. That says, if you're listening to wisdom, especially the instruction of your parents or elders or, or wise people that have gone before you, if you're listening to wisdom, if you're praying for wisdom, if you're searching for wisdom, verse 5 says, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. This is a sort of circular sort of thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if you get, if you get, this, if you search for wisdom, if you, if you pursue God, then you will get understanding and you will understand the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, which will lead to understanding and, and, and so it's kind of circular. The, the more you pursue the Lord, the more understanding you get and the more understanding you get, the more you have the fear of the Lord. And the more fear of the Lord you have, the more you understand. It's circular. It keeps going. It's like a, like a, a ball rolling down a hill. It just kind of picks up steam as it goes. So long as you're in the pursuit of true heavenly wisdom, of that wisdom that comes from above, it's so very, very important. You, uh, you listen to it. You pray for it. You search for it. You wait for it. This search for wisdom is an active passivity comes as God gives it. That doesn't mean you just sit on your haunches and wait. That means you do this searching. You learn the fear of the Lord and you will get this wisdom. Then you will understand it. Heavenly wisdom is, is little like a hidden treasure. That's what the, this passage of scripture, uh, Proverbs 2, is all about. Hidden treasures are generally not obvious to the casual eye. That's why they're called hidden treasures. Most of the time you have to dig to get a hidden treasure, they're usually buried underground. And so you won't find hidden treasure if you just scour the, the landscape, right? You just, you got to look for it. You got to, you got to dig for it. Um, like a miner searching for gold, you who fear the Lord really won't mind digging, will you? If you value it, you'll search for it. That's what's important. If a student is too lazy to study, he shouldn't complain when he flags the test. You guys are out of school now. Isn't that good news for, for right now? But if, if you're too lazy to study, if you get an F, you have no one to blame but yourself. Uh, an Old Testament professor came to the Ministerial Association meeting at Union University when I was a student there a long time ago, about 100 years ago. And, um, and, and we, had some, we had some hyper-spiritual guys in the Ministerial Association. They talked about praying all night and fasting and doing all kinds of stuff that the rest of us you know, we weren't into that stuff at that time and, and all that. And, and so the Old Testament prof took those guys on. He said, you know, you can pray all night, but you're going to fail that Greek test tomorrow if you don't study. <laughs> Practical wisdom. So you who fear the Lord, don't mind searching for wisdom. Don't mind doing what you need to do in order to prepare yourself to receive it as a gift from God. If a Christian is lazy, too lazy to find out what God has to say about things, then it's no surprise that they'll lack understanding on how to handle life. If you don't know what God says about a given issue that may be a burning issue in your life, if you're just relying on what you think or what you feel or what other people tell you or what the culture says that, that you're okay, you're wonderful just the way you are, you know. My favorite guy to bash says it's your time. <laughs> I... If you don't know what God says, don't be surprised that you don't know how to handle what's going on in your life. Colossians 2.3 says, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. That's where you find it. You're wise if you put your faith in Christ. You're a fool if you do not. And, and it's a foolish thing to try to Combine the best of both worlds to rely on yourself to the best you can and to trust in God at the end of your rope. Do your best and God does the rest is a lousy way to go through life. Amen. It's a lousy way to go through life. Well, let's jump over another chapter. Let's drop in on uh, Proverbs chapter 3. Guess where we're going now? Proverbs 3. But probably the most familiar passage of scripture in all the book of Proverbs, trust in the, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart 
And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So far, the one thing that all these Proverbs that I've quoted have in common is about the fear of the Lord. That's the key. That's the key to understanding it. And so when the scripture says, fear the Lord, turn away from evil, it's getting on something that's so very, very important to all of us. Turning from evil is an essential part of pursuing wisdom. You can't hold on to your sin and try to become godly wise at the same time. These things are mutually exclusive. You have one or the other. It's like what Jesus said about uh, serving God and mammon. You can't do both at the same time. You'll either love one and hate the other or, or hate one and love the other. That's, that's, that's all the choice that you have. You can't put those two together. You, can't not, you cannot bring your Christian devotion and pursuing the holiness that God has in store for you along with just living your life the way you want to. It just does not, just does not work. And just because you're under grace, it's not okay to sin. It's important to understand that you're under grace. But just because you're under grace and you know the forgiveness of God and you know at the end of time when, when God prepares that final place for us all to go, that you're going to be okay then, it doesn't make it okay to sin here and now. God holds you accountable for that. And if you want to see a real telling study... There's a downward trend that happens in your life. If you'll just read the latter part of Romans chapter 1, you'll discover three times God gave them over to their depraved nature. I, I, I inserted depraved nature, but that's what it's describing. Basically, what they wanted, what they chose, God gave them to. He doesn't compete with that stuff. You want it? You can have it but you get the consequences that come along with it. And the consequences are nothing that you want to experience in life. There's nothing but depravity and impurity and unholiness and unloveliness in that pursuit of, of sin in your life. Holding on to what you want is a foolish way to go. And the truth of the matter is, in Christ, you have the freedom and the power to break free from sin. You don't have to be in chains to it. You can be, be free from it. I recommend, rather than holding on to what you want, I recommend practicing the spiritual discipline of confession. Now, put your finger in there at Proverbs chapter 3 and turn to 1 John chapter 1. I want you to hear these verses. These verses, these next verses make three in very important points. We, we should have this in our heads. We should have this on our hearts. We should, we should carry this with us wherever we go. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. John writes, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So if you're sitting there in the pew right now and you're thinking, I don't have any sin in my life. John says, you're deceiving yourself. There's no part of the truth that lives in you. If you think you have no sin. If you, the uh, way it's written, John says, is if you just up and say, I have no sin, if you think you're sinless, that's, John says, you're deceiving yourself. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's the good news about that. When you own up to it, when you admit to God that what you're dealing with in your life is sin, when you name it for what it is, when you're under the conviction that God puts on your life that this thing is sin in your life, once you admit it, once you own it, once you claim it, there's instant forgiveness for the believer in Christ. That's like wiping the slate clean. No longer any fear of condemnation or the penalty attached to the fact of sin in your life. That's good news. But that's not the end of the process. Because God wants to go on beyond that and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So he's going to take you through some discipline in order to purify your life. But once you own your sin, you've got to let it go. You've got to turn loose of it. 
in order to be free from it. And then God can purify your life. Now, I know in this congregation and in the hearts and lives of many who are hearing me on radio and watching on TV, you're dealing with stuff that's bigger than you are. And it's debilitating to your life, and it's hurtful to your life, and it's, it's sorrowful for you to deal with. And the place to begin to overcome it is with naming it what it is, calling it a sin. If you'll confess, God is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Verse 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I think this is a great verse for those different uh, sort of Christian fellowships that advocate that salvation comes by way of personal good works. The only assurance you can have will be if you can get to the place where you say, I have not sinned. But guess what? It's too late for all of us. It's too late for even me, as good as I am. Don't laugh at me like that. too late. We all have sin in our lives. We all have sin in our lives. Best way to deal with it is just take it to God. Own it. Claim it before him. You have greater hope admitting your sin to God, dedicating your life to Christ than you have by trying to be okay with your sin. And, and if the end of your discipline is just to be okay, you're going to miss the very blessing of God. How sad. How sad. And Proverbs would say, how foolish is that? So, I say, tune your life to the fear of the Lord. Look at Proverbs, back to Proverbs 3, find verse 8. Proverbs 3, 8 says, it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. That is a physical refreshment that takes place when you have the fear of the Lord and turn away from evil. Verse 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. That's one way to express your, your reverence for God is when, well, when you get your paycheck, don't go very far before you write your tithe check. That's a great way to honor the Lord with your wealth. And that's a wise way to go. The writer of Proverbs is telling us that. So just take his word for it. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. That's the promise that if you put God first, then the rest of life kind of falls into place. Let me put it like this. 100 pianos tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other. They are in one accord, not because they have tuned to each other, but to another standard. And the gold standard in the spiritual life is the fear of the Lord, is reverence for Jesus Christ. And there are few experiences in life that help us do that better than this Lord's Supper where we've come to meet today. At this table, God tells us to remember the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ died for our sins. Th this, is, this is to be a perpetual remembrance for us. Till he comes, we're to celebrate the fact that he died, uh, that he... he uh, died on the cross for us, that the gospel sets us free from sin. And as we take these simple elements, we rehearse the truth that all of eternity is going to celebrate, that Christ loved us and gave himself for us. If you're a Christian, 
and you want your life to be reoriented toward Christ, you want to amend your life to, to be directed toward Jesus, then you're welcome to partake of this Lord's Supper with us. We pass the elements and we all take together at the same time. And you don't have to be a member of our church to participate. But if you do not believe, if you really don't own the gospel of Jesus personally, please just let these elements pass. This celebration means that much to us. We make a big deal out of Christ dying for our sins to save us. And as we handle these elements, we want to worship him who loved us and gave himself for us. I invite you to come to the table. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love. And I pray that as we celebrate now, your spirit will move on our hearts and perform a miracle that will change each of our lives for all the good. We pray that your blessing will be with us to your glory, to your honor, to your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. At that last supper with his disciples, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks for it, even as we do just now. We thank you, our Father, for the bread of life that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. He broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, eat this bread and remember me.
bread, remembering Jesus. After the supper, Jesus took the cup and he shared it with his disciples and he defined it as his blood of the new covenant that was given for them that brought them into a relationship with God and he once again said drink it and remember me we drink this cup remembering Christ. drink this cup remembering Jesus. The big three temptations to sin, to live in sin, fall in the areas of money, 
sex, and power. 